pleasure last night of being here and meeting many of the volunteers that helped put on this event. And uh, a big shout out and thank you to all the volunteers. If you could do that for me. I, wonderful people. They all gathered last night. So I'm Jason Johnson. I'm the CEO and co-founder of August. We make the August Smart Lock. It's a smartphone controlled door lock. And over the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about the real future of the smart home. What does it look like? You know, we've been dreaming about the future for many years, and we have uh, great science fiction books and, and movies and TV shows that help us think of the future and think about what the future could bring us. And, you know, we have a lot of things we want to see happen in our homes, right? That our, our home can be this, this automated place where your food is prepared for you and the dishes are cleaned up automatically and the floors are cleaned and... I don't know about you, I watched the Jetsons as a child and, and I dreamed of all these robots and, and fun things you could have in the home. And really around smart home technology, we see devices that maybe provide some convenience. They, they, they help alleviate some of the burden, some of the hassle of day-to-day -day activities. Maybe they save us some time and some energy. And then maybe some of these devices can deliver a little bit of magic, a little bit of delight in our daily lives. Most of us know we want all kinds of technology in our lives. We want, we want things to be responsive and interactive and, and, and work for us. And many of us have adopted technology to do that for us. We carry these, these tools in our pockets that do that, and now on our wrists. So we know what we want. The question is when and how do we have this real interaction in the home? When do we have the smart home? So I'm going to talk about the history of adoption of technology in the home. I'm going to talk about how we discover technology for the home. And then lastly, I'm going to give some ideas, some suggestions to the industry and how we can rethink this experience of discovery and adoption. So, adoption of technology in the home. And I mean real adoption, right? This is the real future of the smart home. And let's just say that real adoption means the majority of homes, more than 50% of homes. There's 123 million homes in the U.S. That's a lot of homes. And trying to get technology into the home over the years has been very difficult for product companies, service providers. It's, it's hard to get people to adopt technology when there's already some kind of a solution in place. One of my favorite smart home technologies has been around for more than 12 years. It's multi-room audio. So in the morning in my house, uh, there's a little bit of a French bistro music plays in the kitchen. When you come home in the evening, we have this like martini jazz music playing in the living room in the kitchen. It's delightful to have multi-room music, and, and these companies had these controller pads on the walls at one time, and now you just use your smartphone or it's just automated. And yet, after 12 years, these companies like Sonos and Savant and Crestron and Control4 have only got about 5 million homes in the U.S. That's less than 1%, I'm sorry, less than 5% of U.S. homes have multi-room music, even though the technology's been around for quite some time. Smart door locks, They've been around for about seven years. I'd like to say that the August Smart Lock is the first. We're not. For seven years, the big lock companies have made smart door locks. And yet, less than 1% penetration of smart door locks in the US. And it's not much different worldwide. So, let's look at how this can happen faster. And in fact, we are adopting technology in the home faster. But to get to 50% adoption, how many years does it typically take for new technology? Let's look at the telephone. This was a major innovation in the early 20th century. Guess how many years it took to get to 50% adoption? More than 50 years. This wasn't an infrastructure problem. This was a problem of people understanding, why would I need a telephone? Why would I call my neighbor when I could just drive or walk down the street and talk to them in person? It took that long for that technology to be adopted. The dishwasher. And some of you you, know, you don't have dishwashers, right? And that's, and that's great. It's actually kind of fun, you know, in a zen way to wash dishes, right? To get to 50% of adoption in the U.S., it took 45 years for the dishwasher penetration. Automobile, 25 years. The stove, and this was a big deal, right? You could cook your food inside the house. You didn't have to have outdoor fire pits. 40 years for the stove. The refrigerator. Now this was a major technological innovation. Like this, this was a big deal. This, this actually impacted mortality. This actually increased the birth rate in America. A major technological achievement. It took 20 years to get to the majority of homes. Personal computer, 20 years. 
This is a chart that shows over the 20th century how these various technologies were adopted over what time periods. If you look in the first half of the 20th century, you'll see that it, it took about 20 to 50 years for these technologies to be adopted. In the second half of the 20th century, it got a little faster, but still it took about 20 plus years for many of these technologies to reach critical mass, majority of homes. There's a special club called the 10-year club. The 10-year club are those technologies that took less than 10 years to get to majority of homes. The VCR, the color television, microwaves, radio, cell phones. And what would you guess would be one of the fastest technologies to be adopted in the home just in recent years? Some of you are going to guess it. Broadband internet. We're approaching almost 80% penetration in the US. And it's not just the internet service. A very interesting thing about broadband is that when the cable television company or the DSL provider or say Google Fiber brings that connection to the home, they also bring with it Wi-Fi. And that's what, how many of us acquire Wi-Fi in our home. And now we have almost 80% Wi-Fi penetration. So these service providers are playing a key role in introducing new technologies to the home. And that's why I'm very excited to share some news today that August has partnered with Comcast for Comcast to offer the August Smart Lock to Comcast Xfinity customers. This is a very big opportunity for us to help bring our technology to more homes in the US. And having the representatives of Comcast, whether they're on the phone with you or they're standing in your living room, setting up your cable television and telling you about the August Smart Lock is a, is a new way to discover a new technology. Let's talk more about discovery and how we go about discovering technology for the home. How many of you in here have a dog? Let me see your, your, your hands raised. There's a lot of dog owners. Okay, me too. So, about six, seven years ago, I had a dog door in my house. It came with the house, and it was a good sized dog door. I know it was a good size because one day I lost my keys to my house, and I had to climb over my, my neighbor's fence, and I crawled in the dog door. I could fit through the dog door, which means it's not very secure. Anybody could crawl through my dog door and get in my house. So. One evening, it's late at night, we hear this rustling, this noise, chaos happening in our kitchen where this dog door is. And I run into the kitchen, I turn on the lights, and there's a family of raccoons eating my dog food, tearing up the kitchen, making a ruckus. My dog is going crazy. Everything turned out okay. I didn't get injured, my dog didn't get injured. But the next day, I went and researched, is there a better way? Is there a better dog door? Maybe a smart dog door. And about seven years ago, I installed this device. It's a little collar that my dog wears, and it only lets him in and out of that dog door. The raccoons can't come in, other dogs can't come in, even burglars can't come in. It's got a special design where you can kick it with your foot, you can't break in. It's a great product. And yet, many of you dog owners never heard about it. The reason being, you walk into a Home Depot or a Target or a Best Buy, you generally won't see a product like that. Okay, there's some cat people in the audience too, I don't want to leave you out. Did you know there's a variety of automated cat litter boxes? If you've ever had to change cat litter, you know how nice it would be to have that fully automated. There's even a venture capital backed company, very successful, that makes a completely automated cat litter box. You, you attach it to your plumbing, into the drain, and you do nothing. It literally cleans the plastic granules, it then has a dryer built, it dries the plastic granules, everything is completely automated, you do nothing. It almost makes us dog owners want to get a cat. But there's intimidation around these technologies. How do I set up that cat litter box or that dog door, right? It's, there's, there's fear about trying these new technologies. And even though our friends perhaps are recommending these products to us and we learn about things like this on social media, the truth is most of us don't discover new products that way. The way that most consumers, particularly around the home, discover technology is at retail. We, brought, we browse the aisles at the Apple store or at Best Buy. And this is the way we learn about new products. And if you're lucky, you might find a, a person in a red shirt or a blue shirt that can explain the technology to you, maybe possibly let you touch it and see how it works. But for the most part, that retail experience has not been changed. It's exactly the same as it's been for many, many years. So, I'm going to make a couple suggestions to the industry. One, let's rethink the retail experience and how 
we touch and feel and experience and try new products. Let's have a new paradigm. There's amazing new companies or services from companies that allow us to get products same day. Postmates, Instacart, of course Amazon and Google have services. And it's great because you can be at your desk, you can learn about some gadget for your home that you want, you can order it, you get home that evening and that package is sitting on your doorstep. At least hopefully it's sitting on your doorstep. In San Francisco it might walk away. But you can get home and you can open up the package, you can try that product. And it's great, you didn't have to go to the store to pick it up. But one of the challenges is, let's say it doesn't work for you. Let's say you try it, it just doesn't, it just doesn't fit your home, maybe your spouse doesn't like it, maybe you just don't like it. And if you want to take it back to the store, you have to put it in the box, you have to drive down to the store, stand in line at the customer service counter, perhaps beg them to take it back. Oh, you forgot the owner's manual. Can't take that back. There's a hassle. There's a hassle that causes us not to even want to try it, right? What if we rethought the retail experience? What if we rethought the way that people tried things? Maybe we expanded the return window, Maybe we made it more flexible. You don't have to have all the packaging. And you can try things in your home risk-free. I think there's some great opportunities for us to do that. One of my favorite uh, startups is called SHIP. And SHIP has thought about the reverse logistics challenge. In other words, if you buy something on Target.com or Amazon.com and you don't like it, using the SHIP app, you take a picture of the product, they come to your house, they take it, put it in a box, tape it shut, put a label on it, and take it to UPS or FedEx or the postal store for you. You do nothing. It is a great, inexpensive way to try things and not to do with the hassle of returning them. I think there's a great opportunity there. Lastly, rethinking the purchase model. For most technologies, we have to buy it outright. We have to buy, say, a Wi-Fi router. But as I mentioned earlier, Comcast and Time Warner Cable and AT&T, these companies now are providing free wireless routers when they install your cable modem, your DSL modem. I would suggest we would not have 80% Wi-Fi penetration in the US, but for those companies providing that product, as part of that monthly fee, you pay for your cable or DSL box. Maybe it's five, eight, ten dollars a lot cheaper, much more affordable than going to the store and buying a $150 wireless router. Why not finance all products for the smart home that way? What if you didn't have to pay out of pocket for some of these devices? To buy these four devices, it would cost you roughly $830. And for the average American, that's a lot of money. In fact, it's prohibitive for the average American. What if we change the model? What if the retailers or the service providers let us pay a monthly fee for these products? Much more affordable, much more easy way for people to try technology, experience in their home in a way that fits their finances. They could even go one step further. Many of the cellular companies now are letting you upgrade your mobile phone as new models come out. You could do the same thing for hardware for the home. You could make it very simple and easy for people to upgrade to new hardware and not have to deal with what do I do with the old one now that I have the new one. There's a great opportunity here for the smart home to deliver the real smart home with these new paradigms of retail and trying things and reducing the friction to adoption. I believe that if we can do this, if we can change the way people experience technology in the home, we can get to real smart home penetration in five years and it's up to the industry Companies like August are being challenged to bring this future to all of us so we can experience the real smart home of the future. Thank you.